Welcome to today's biostatistics um, lecture series. Um, today, we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Jean Fan. Um, Dr. Fan is assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Johns Hopkins. Um, prior to that, um, she uh, was an NCI um, F99 K00 postdoc um, in the lab of um, Dr. Zhaowei Zhang uh, at Harvard University, where she developed methods for spatial transcriptomics. Um, and before that, she received her PhD in bioinformatics and integrative genomics at Harvard, um, working with uh, uh, Dr. Peter uh, Charkenko uh, um, at the Department of uh, Biomedical Informatics, uh, working with Dr. Catherine Hu at Dana Farber. Um, and so there, you know, uh, part, um, uh, she developed methods for analysis of single cell transcriptomics and transcriptional heterogeneity. Um, and so now uh, Dr. Fan and her lab, JeffWorks, um, uh, are you know continuing to push the forefront um, in terms of uh, statistical methodologies and computational methodologies for modern transcriptomic analysis and um, uh, visualization. So I'm really excited to have Dr. Fan here today, um, so we can learn a little bit more about her more recent work. Um, and so let's please welcome uh, Dr. Fan. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much to Nick for the invitation. And yes, uh, today I'll be sharing with you all a little bit about our more recent work on um, analyzing spatially resolved transcriptomics data, um, but mostly focusing on modeling and visualizing RNA velocity of single cells. So let's see. Ah, great. So before I jump into it, I just wanted to show you all some of the friendly faces behind the work that you're about to see. Uh, this is my lab currently, and uh, I started my lab actually in July of last year, so in the middle of the pandemic. And as a result, none of my lab members have been able to meet each other or actually even meet me in person, at least. Uh, so that's been a, a very interesting uh, journey. Um, but through it all, I think we're, we've been um, yeah, learning things as we go along and, and uh, definitely excited to be working together and also potentially establishing collaborations uh, um, you know, with other institutions as well. So generally speaking, I think the big picture uh, research interest of my group is really to try to understand how spatial contextual factors, uh, both within the cell and also of cells within the tissue, uh, play a role in defining you know, cell type identity and establishing that cellular heterogeneity and how that all relates to uh, the function uh, uh, within the tissue and in the larger organism. Uh, so for example, you know, specific questions that we're interested in uh, related to how mRNAs are organized within cells. And this is of particular interest in highly polarized cell types like the neuron, where you know, we have to, uh, the neuron potentially has to respond to a lot, large number of local signals uh, via you know, local translation and you know, what are the different uh, active transport mechanisms that you know, allow these genes to go where they need to go so that they can be turned into protein and, uh, and allow the, the neuron to perform its functions. Uh, likewise, um, we're very interested in how cell types and cell states are organized within tissues, uh, particularly uh, within cancers, um, where we know, for example, you know, neoplastic uh, cell, 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 cell populations uh, perhaps even genetically or uh, epigenetically distinct neoplastic populations might be interacting you know, with the uh, components of the tuple microenvironment. And of course, there's a spatial organization uh, to that interaction. So then uh, luckily, um, uh, there have been quite a number of advances in both uh, sequencing and imaging uh, based uh, technologies that have enabled high throughput spatially resolved transcriptomic profiling at you know, both single cell and near single cell resolution in fixed tissues. Uh, just a few of the methods are noted here and you know, it's, it's you know, been a year and I feel like this, this slide is already somewhat outdated. Uh, but you know, we have techniques uh, based on uh, in situ hybridization uh, and also um, uh, spatially resolved capture followed by sequencing. Uh, but generally what these methods allow us to do is to uh, profile the gene expression of um, either cells or in, you know, in the case of 10x visium, you know, pixels in the spatially resolved manner. So we can measure what genes are expressed in you know, this particular uh, region of the tissue and do that for many little regions or little cells within the tissue. 
And of course, using that transcriptomic measurements, you know, we can begin uh, interrogating what are the different cell types and cell states, uh, and then also potentially a subcellular organization as well. So of course uh, we need, uh, you know, th this is very large data. So you know, we need new computational and statistical approaches to be able to analyze such, you know, single cell and spatially resolved transcriptomics data. Um, my lab has uh, previously contributed to various um, single cell analysis approaches. And uh, as Nick mentioned, we're now uh, developing new methods uh, focused on the, on the spatially resolved transcriptomics data. Uh, but for more of our general thoughts on how um, these, uh, what are the, you know, some of the computational challenges in analyzing these single cell and spatially resolved transcriptomics data sets, particularly as it applies to cancer, uh, you can read more about that in our uh, Nature EMM review, which was from a year ago. Um, but as I mentioned, one of these uh, spatially resolved transcriptomic profiling techniques is called MRFISH or multiplex aerobus fluorescence in situ hybridization, which was uh, developed in my postdoc lab uh, with Dr. Xiaowei Zhuang. And generally, uh, you know, Murfish, uh, to learn more about it, you can, uh, I guess I would recommend you check out the Chen and Ao paper in Science from 2015. But uh, it broadly, you know, very generally speaking, it, it uses combinatorial labeling and error robust barcoding along with sequential imaging to, uh, to be able to image uh, targeted uh, RNA you know, species within uh, uh, cultured or fixed cells, um, yeah, fixed tissues. Uh, so what this generally means is, you know, for a particular cell here, this is a big picture of a cell after you know, many rounds of imaging, uh, we can uh, decode effectively what are the um, RNA species identities for all the different molecules uh, or RNAs within the cell. So here, you know, I've highlighted, you know, one gene, but, you know, we can do that for not only one or two genes, but now actually uh, up to 10,000. Uh, different gene species. And of course, you know, we can do this not only for you know, one cell, but for um, hundreds to thousands to millions of cells uh, within um, uh, fixed uh, tissues and uh, you know, cultured systems. Um, and, and then of course we can you know, segment these cells and essentially count the number of genes uh, or of each gene species within each cell uh, and that allows us to achieve um, single cell resolution, spatially resolved transcriptomic profiling. So previously um, in our PNIS paper from now two years ago, uh, we uh, applied MRFISH to uh, profile uh, to over 10,000 genes in U2OS cells. And that allowed us to begin asking questions regarding um, not only the spatial organization of RNAs within the cell, but then also the organization of transcriptionally distinct cell states, uh, in this case, within culture. Um, but uh, briefly, just um, uh, for, for more information, of course, you're welcome to check out the paper. But uh, in terms of, whoops, in terms of intracellular RNA organization, uh, we were very interested in seeing if we could um, figure out essentially what uh, genes co-localize with different subcellular structures like the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so, you know, we can, you know, given this, uh, this is an imaging based approach, we can essentially, um, you know, image the endoplasmic reticulum along with all these, you know, 10,000 different genes and ask, you know, on a pixel level, you know, which of these mRNA molecules are spatially co-localized with uh, the, the pixels that correspond to our, our endoplasmic reticulum. And, and that way, you know, allows us to quantify, um, you know, the, the gene expression within the ER endoplasmic reticulum and the gene expression outside the endoplasmic reticulum for all of our cells. And, you know, that allows us to then do a pairwise, you know, Wilcoxon test and identify, you know, genes that are highly enriched in the endoplasmic reticulum. And of course, then we can visualize these genes um, uh, overlaid onto our endoplasmic reticulum image and just begin you know, visually appreciating how, like, for example, even in the very fine uh, rough ER networks, uh, you still see uh, as expected, you know, the, the significant spatial co-localization of these different gene species with this uh, very fine network. 
Uh, and likewise, we can you know, move a little more um, outwards towards uh, from the subcellular to the cellular and ask um, you know, what are the different types of cellular organization that we can see um, are certain you know, transcriptionally distinct cell states uh, spatially colloquialized with other cell states uh, and begin testing, for example, you know, among the K nearest neighbors of each cell state, what uh, distribution of cell states do we see? Um, and again, this is a culture system, so it wasn't particularly interesting in my opinion. Um, but, but now we've began applying these methods to tissues and I'll show you a little bit about the, a little bit of those results, which are in my opinion, a lot more exciting. Uh, so, so now um, uh, since then, um, uh, we've began applying MRFish to uh, characterize the spatial organization of you know, not just cultured cells, but uh, more polarized cell types such as the neuron. Uh, so this is work led by Guiping Wang, who was a phenomenal graduate student in Xiao Wei's lab, who's now moved on to, uh, to do her postdoc. Uh, but in this particular bioprint that she led, a, a preprint uh, bioarchive that she led, um, we, we profiled the spatial organization of uh, up to uh, 4,200 different genes within uh, cultured hippocampal neurons. And you know, what this then allows us to do is, again, we can begin looking at the subcellular organization of these distinct gene species within neurons. So here we have you know, a neuron, you can see you know, there's the cell body, these are the dendrites, and uh, we can begin quantitatively evaluating you know, gene, the gene expression in these different compartments, you know, for example, within the cell soma versus within the dendrite versus within the axon. Uh, but then we can also try to see if there's certain gene expression that is uh, variable along you know, these processes like the dendrite. So are there certain genes that are co-localized at you know, branch points that are um, you know, more abundant towards the, um, towards the area of the dendrite that's closer to the cell soma uh, versus, um, uh, you know, versus just more peripheral away from the cell body and uh, begin uh, yeah, doing that characterization. And that's been yeah, ongoing, but very exciting work. And uh, as I mentioned, we also have begun applying MRFish to characterize the spatial organization of transcriptionally distinct um, cell types, or in this case, uh, cancer subpopulations and um, immune cells uh, within tissues. Uh, so in particular, we were focusing on glioblastoma. This is a collaboration with uh, Toshihara uh, in Mario Suva's lab uh, with uh, Lila Ada and my group. Um, but for uh, just a little bit of background in glioblastoma, uh, previous single cell analyses have identified um, four distinct um, neoplastic subpopulations that seem to at least mirror the, the normal um, you know, developmental trajectory of uh, 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 glial progenitors. So, you know, we have these uh, OPC-like uh, glioblastoma cells, and then these MPC-like glioblastoma cells, and astrocytic-like glioblastoma cells, and uh, mesenchymal-like glioblastoma cells. Uh, so even within the context of an individual patient, we can have these four different uh, transcriptional subtypes, um, uh, transcriptional uh, sub subpopulations um, uh, within the same uh, glioblastoma tumor. So what we wanted to do is uh, essentially uh, um, interrogate the spatial organization of these, um, these cancer subpopulations uh, in conjunction with um, immune cells and the tumor microenvironment. Uh, so we applied MRFish and you know, we can get the gene expression of the cells and you know, do our TISNI or dimensionality reduction, much like the way we would do for a single cell sequencing. And based on the expression of different marker genes, annotate you know, these clusters where you know, these are all different little cells uh, assayed by MRFish, but we can uh, cluster them and annotate them based on um, yeah, marker genes as you know, these are oligodendrocytes, uh, these are glioblastoma cells, and you have the mesenchymal subtype uh, over here, and likewise, um, yeah, T cells and macrophages. Uh, but the, the fun part with spatial data is that now we not only have you know, the transcriptionally distinct clusters, but we can see how they're organized within uh, the tissue. Uh, so for this particular Murfish experiment, we actually did two uh, consecutive uh, slices of the same biopsy. 
uh, just for um, just to try to evaluate how reproducible some of these patterns were. Um, and yeah, so again, each point here is a single cell, but now they're colored based on our clustering. Um, so we can begin asking you know, questions like, you know, for the mesenchymal subtype, uh, within the 30 nearest neighbors of you know, each mesenchymal uh, glioblastoma cell in the tissue, um, what is the distribution of other cell types that we see? And do we see, um, uh, yeah, so, so for example, you know, when we do this with uh, the, uh, when we look at uh, the number of macrophages in the nearest neighbors of the mesenchymal cells, uh, we get uh, uh, something that's uh, leaning towards significance, but generally we get more macrophages than what we expect by random chance based on just randomly permuting these labels. Um, whereas in contrast, if we look at the number of oligodendrocytes within the nearest neighbors of the mesenchymal subtype, uh, we don't really, we, we, see a, uh, we don't see a significant enrichment. Um, and uh, likewise, you know, we looked at this for the other uh, subtypes, uh, but the mesenchymal um, subtype and macrophage co-localization was one that uh, was the only one that really stood out to us. Uh, and then interestingly, uh, Toshi um, and Mario's lab was able to conduct uh, quite a number of really phenomenal functional validations in uh, xenograft models to show that actually you know, this spatial co-localization is like, not random. It's um, the, the, there's a, actually a particular receptor ligand interaction between the macrophages and mesenchymal subtypes uh, that, um, that then actually um, uh, mediates the transition of glioblastoma cells into the mesenchymal state. Uh, so, so there's uh, definitely an interaction between you know, these different immune cells and neoplastic cells within the uh, glioblastoma ecosystem. And these interactions you know, drive these glioblastoma cells into uh, you know, different states. Um, so, so this is uh, yeah, this is work that uh, is currently in press in a cancer cell, and I think it should come out like within a few weeks. So, so definitely uh, take a uh, be on the lookout for that if this is of interest to you. And then, uh, of course, uh, this this general data is uh, it's quite large. Uh, you know, we have um, in this case over two million mRNAs within a, a single experiment, uh, and just um, essentially just browsing and visualizing this data can become quite cumbersome. Uh, so we developed a, a React-based um, WebGL based uh, visualizer. Uh, to to allow us to try to uh, you know, just peruse this data before we dive into any uh, deep analysis, and it's been particularly helpful for uh, as we generate you know new data and want to uh, just take a look at it before we analyze it very thoroughly. So then, I think the the main um, point I actually wanted to teach you all today was actually regarding a, a limitation of this type of data, uh, both. Um, spatially resolved transcriptomics data and also single cell RNA sequencing data. And that limitation is just that these cells are fixed. So the expression measurements we obtain represent you know, these static snapshots in time. Uh, ideally, you know, for example, in the glioblastoma experiment, what we would like to do is, you know, let's say, follow the uh, glioblastoma cells as they interact with the macrophages and and we can see them upregulating, you know, genes let's say associated with the mesenchymal subtype, and be able to you know, see that uh, temporal dynamic. Uh, but unfortunately, that's currently uh, not possible. But that doesn't necessarily mean that all dynamic information is lost. Uh, so you know, as you can see here, we have a, a static snapshot of uh, friends jumping off a cliff into the water, and even though this is a static snapshot in time. Uh, we can leverage essentially the, the, the dynamic of, or the fact that these uh, friends are at uh, different stages of jumping off the cliff. You know, some people jumped off earlier and some people jumped off later, but we can take advantage of this uh, dynamic um, uh, progression along this uh, trajectory and use that uh, uh, to uh, create in this particular case, you know, like a pseudo temporal ordering. Uh, and actually with a few additional assumptions, like you know, we're, we're all smart enough to know that gravity goes down, uh, that uh, piece of information allows us to create uh, not only a pseudotemporal ordering, but 
uh, provide direction to that pseudo-temporal ordering. Uh, so we know that you know, this person jumped off first and then followed by this person and so on and so forth. So, um, and in the same vein, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the spatial positions in this particular case of the friends along this uh, you know, trajectory uh, can also help us predict the future you know, positional state of you know, this friend that you know, even though gravity is going down, uh, we can infer you know, some level of information about the angular momentum that he must have jumped off this cliff with. So at a future time point, he's probably going to uh, at least spatially you know, be more in the position of this friend uh, rather than um, you know, let's say dropping directly downwards. So this is kind of the, this is generally the same intuition behind RNA velocity analysis uh, or RNA velocity in situ analysis as well, where uh, we're, even though we have the static snapshot uh, in this case of, um, you know, of cells and their uh, RNAs, um, we can take certain uh, advantage of certain information such as the fact that we can uh, distinguish between uh, mRNAs within the nucleus versus our mRNAs within the cytoplasm. Uh, as highlighted here, here's one cell where we've segmented out the, the nucleus versus the cytoplasm. Uh, each dot is a different mRNA and they've been colored you know, blue if they're um, co-localized with the cytoplasm and green if they're within the nucleus. And we can essentially quantify uh, what's the gene expression for each cell within the nucleus and versus the cytoplasm. Uh, and you know this is this information is useful to us because um, you know we for based on our you know um, biology 101 uh, we know that genes are uh, transcribed within the nucleus and then they eventually get exported into the cytoplasm uh, where they can be translated into proteins and the RNAs eventually get degraded. Um, but essentially, then using this information that we can glean from this you know, static snapshot of spatially resolved transcriptomic profiling of these cells, uh, we can, um, as I mentioned before, you know, leverage this nuclear and cytoplasmic gene expression quantification to predict the future transcriptional state of cells now um, by, you know, we assume again, this very simple uh, model where we assume transcription to be this constant that leads to the accumulation of nuclear RNA, which we can quantify and count. Uh, we assume export, uh, these RNAs are exported at a, at a constant rate uh, into the cytoplasm, where again, we can count the expression. Uh, and then that just leads to a, a variable degradation rate. Um, um, but then we can model the rate of change of the cytoplasmic mRNA levels as a function of what comes in minus what goes out. But what this allows us to do is then, um, you know, looking across a population of cells, you know, we might expect some cells to be in steady state, which means that there's no rate of change for this uh, DCDT. So this equals zero. So we have some expected uh, ratio in terms of nuclear versus cytoplasmic expression levels. Um, and then there are going to be other, oops, there's going to be other cells in the population that you know, have higher nuclear expression than what we expect from the steady state. So these, uh, we can interpret these cells as actively upregulating this particular gene. So you know, it's actively transcribing and therefore it leads to a higher accumulation uh, of this mRNA within the nucleus. Uh, and conversely, you know, in the, if we see a, a depletion uh, of this part a particular gene, um, uh, in terms of like having a lower nuclear versus cytoplasmic ratio, we can interpret this gene, gene as being downregulated in a particular cell. So looking at our real data, uh, you know, our, it's always good to see if the real data uh, somewhat matches your model. Uh, indeed, we can see that you know, each point here is a single cell on the x-axis is the cytoplasmic expression level and the y-axis is the nuclear. And indeed we can see you know, some cells are actively upregulating this gene, MCM6, whereas other cells are uh, down, or I guess these, these cells, the red cells are also downregulating KIF2C, whereas uh, the purple cells are upregulating KIF2C. So what this means is that, you know, using this information, uh, we can not only have the observed transcriptional state for every cell, so this is for one cell, you know, each column is a gene, red is high expression, blue is low expression, so you know, we, this is a high dimensional representation of the gene expression vector for this cell. Um, but we have this you know, observed transcriptional state for a cell 
And RNA velocity analysis allows us to then predict the future transcriptional state. So perhaps you know this chain here uh, is like here. You know currently it's pretty low, but we predict that uh, at a future time point, based on the higher nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, that this chain must be being upregulated. So at a future time point, it'll be higher in expression. And we can do this for essentially all the genes that we're able to fit this model to and then predict the future transcriptional state of these cells. And what this means is, uh, you know, in addition to doing clustering analysis, you know, with our, as we do with single cell RNA sequencing data, where we take our matrix of gene by cell, you know, we can project it into two dimensional space with TISNI and color the cells based on um, their, um, you know, transcriptional clustering with via community de detection. And we can also identify differentially expressed genes in each cluster. Uh, so this, this actually is uh, U2OS cells. So they're uh, cultured cells, which don't have a lot of uh, transcriptional or don't have a lot of different cell types uh, per se, but they have uh, transcriptionally distinct cell states that are associated with uh, different cell cycle stages. Um, so if you recognize these genes, a lot of them are cell cycle related, uh, which is unsurprising. Um, but then with RNA velocity analysis, what we can do is, again, you know, take our observed states and uh, also predict a future state and project both of these states onto our two-dimensional embeddings and connect them via an arrow. And when we do this, uh, we can see that, you know, there is a predicted uh, ordering to the or cyclical structure uh, to the cells. Uh, where you know cells here are, are are predicted to be moving in a transcriptional direction towards cells here, and so on and so forth. And um, perhaps unsurprisingly, based on some of the differentially expressed genes uh, in these clusters, um, it's really uh, highlighting how they're progressing through the different cell cycle stages. But then uh, having this um, pseudotemporal uh, or having this um, directed ordering from RNA velocity. Uh, we can uh, uh, interpret the, you know, the cells ordering along the cycle as the pseudo time, and then begin looking at uh, the expression of different genes as a function of pseudo times. So, um, for example, for MCM6, as I highlighted previously, it's not surprising that you know it becomes upregulated during the G1S phase, and likewise for KIF2C, it's upregulated during M phase. Oops. So we can confirm a lot of our, you know, favorite cell cycle genes. Uh, but then we can also ask uh, statistically uh, what genes have expression variants that can be explained by pseudo time. You know, have have expression variants that can be uh, modeled based on uh, the based on pseudo time. Uh, and uh, using that approach, we can actually then uh, identify uh, over um, a thousand different uh, cell cycle related genes or genes that have expression variants that's uh, um, related to progression through the cell cycle. And in that manner, we can begin appreciating uh, essentially just all the different um, kind of gradual transcriptional changes that the cell has to go through in order to progress through the cell cycle. So here again, each point is a single cell uh, in the Tisney plot, uh, but I'm coloring them based on their expression of these different genes. And you can just see, um, uh, you know, as, as the cell progresses through the cell cycle, it, it just needs to, uh, it has to upregulate all of these different genes in succession in a, in a reasonably uh, gradual manner. And of course, uh, more recently, uh, this is unpublished work, but we've began uh, trying to apply RNA velocity and C2 analysis uh, to tissues. Uh, so the, the, the major challenge within tissues is, uh, of course, you know, cells are no longer on a, on a single cultured plane. Uh, they're kind of all over the place. Uh, and also, um, uh, they're generally, they have generally been more difficult to segment, um, the, the, perhaps, you know, by virtue of existing in a 3D environment instead of on a 2D surface, uh, the, the cell shapes uh, or the cell nuclear structures are a little bit more difficult to distinguish from the, from the uh, cytoplasm and so forth. Um, but we've, uh, we've leveraged a lot of uh, newer uh, deep learning segmentation-based approaches to try to uh, distinguish um, the nuclear nucleus from the cytoplasm for cells within tissues. And um, encouragingly, we can, um, um, for example, uh, 
uh, recapitulate some expected uh, trajectories, such as the progression of uh, ligus dendrocyte progenitor cells within the, the this is the mouse preoptic region, but we can get the oligodendrocyte progenitors and also the mature oligodendrocytes and show that you know, our velocity uh, in situ analysis in this particular case uh, predicts uh, a progression from the oligodendrocyte progenitors towards the mature oligodendrocytes. And uh, the genes driving this, uh, this trajectory are also you know, what we expect uh, as uh, genes canonically known to drive this differentiation. So then, of course, the you know, RNA velocity was initially developed um, during the, the tail end of my PhD work in Peter Karchenko's group uh, in collaboration with Stellan Arsen's group. Um, but initially, we had developed it for um, single cell uh, RNA sequencing rather than imaging based approaches. And uh, in the same vein, instead of using nuclear and cytoplasmic RNAs, uh, we can use uh, spliced and unspliced mRNAs inferred from sequencing to do the same type of modeling. And what this allows us to do, of course, is again, um, uh, derive these, um, not only a pseudotemporal ordering, but provide a, a directionality onto our you know, reduced two-dimensional spaces that then allow us, you know, without any prior knowledge, to be able to identify uh, you know, the putative progenitors uh, that are giving rise to, you know, in this case, the different uh, glial subpopulations versus the neuronal subpopulations. And then we can also begin diving into, you know, what are the transcriptional states necessary uh, at these different differentiation forks in order for the cells to eventually, you know, progress into these terminally differentiated cell states. Okay, so I think one um, uh, perhaps challenge that, uh, um, that you know, the, these uh, visualizing RNA velocity in terms of visualizing RNA velocity is that um, currently, uh, you know, all the examples I showed you um, are, were based on uh, projecting the observed and future transcriptional states onto established 2D embeddings that are uh, actually based on the observed transcriptional state alone. So for example, you know, we can take uh, single cell sequencing data, RNA sequencing data of uh, cells uh, in the embryonic pancreas, um, which is uh, pancreas di differentiation as a generally pretty well um, uh, uh, evaluated uh, system where we would you know, expect there to be, for example, cycling ductal cells that give rise to endocrine progenitor cells uh, that then eventually differentiate into the uh, different hormone secreting cell types of the pancreas. But we can do um, you know, single cell sequencing uh, on the, the developing pancreatic tissue uh, and you know, obtain our matrix of gene by cell. And you know, we can visualize this uh, uh, data using a number of dimensionality reduction or 2D embedding visualizations uh, like PCA, TISME, UMAP, and diffusion map. Um, and then, of course, we can project our RNA velocities onto these established embeddings. Um, but what you might notice is that, you know, these different embeddings kind of pick up on different features of the, whoops, of the, of the expected um, uh, uh, cellular trajectory uh, in that, you know, they actually all do a pretty good job of capturing the progression of, you know, endocrine progenitor or EP cells into uh, pre-endocrine cells, um, um, and likewise, I think UMAP and TISNE do a better job of ca capturing the, the four you know, terminally differentiated uh, cell states, or the branching of the pre-endocrine cells into these uh, four different terminally hormone secreting cell states or cell types. Um, but, but yeah, depending on the, the 2D embedding you choose, you might end up with a slightly different I guess, uh, interpretation of uh, these, uh, of this, uh, the underlying cellular trajectory. And this becomes uh, even more um, uh, challenging um, when uh, certain cell states might be missing. Uh, so this is of particular interest to us um, where, um, you know, in, uh, in, in regards to neuronal differentiation, where um, you know, certain subpopulations are actually quite sensitive to the dissociation process. Um, so we're a little bit concerned about you know, if, single, if you know, through the process of acquiring the single cell sequencing data, 
uh, certain cell states or intermediate, yeah, certain cell states may be lost um, due to the sensitivity to that process. Um, and likewise, in the context of cancers, uh, we might often, you know, observe, let's say, the, the cancer stem cell state and also the more, um, uh, more uh, mature, uh, uh, you know, plastic subtypes, uh, but we might not see all the intermediate transitions um, due to just a, a fact of um, uh, sampling uh, at certain time points. Uh, so, so we try to simulate this uh, in the pancreatic differentiation example by uh, artificially removing the preendocrine cells um, and then, you know, we, we now have a, a GANA matrix of gene by cell, but all the preendocrine cells have been removed, and we can try to visualize this matrix using dimensionality rejection. Um, but now what you'll notice is that, um, you know, uh, certain approaches in particular, uh, I like to highlight, you know, for example, the UMAP embedding, um, uh, because uh, a lot of these visualization approaches or embedding approaches try to prioritize local cell-cell differences, um, it doesn't necessarily uh, end up capturing the global um, cellular trajectory. Uh, in this particular case, you know, it, it captures really well the cycling ductal cells uh, that then uh, differentiate into the endocrine progenitors. Uh, but there's uh, no way for it to connect the endocrine progenitors to the, you know, four terminally differentiated hormone secreting cell types. And actually, you know, given this particular visualization, if you didn't have any prior knowledge regarding um, pancreatic development, uh, perhaps you'd be led astray and, you know, led to believe that these endocrine progenitor cells are differentiating towards something else uh, rather than towards the, the, the hormone secreting cell types. So faced with this challenge, uh, Lila Ada and my group, uh, um, uh, along with help from Arpan Sahu, uh, developed a, a tool called VeloViz, where we try to integrate RNA velocity information directly in order to visualize the cellular trajectories. So just briefly, uh, our, we do have a preprint available on BioArchive, and uh, there are also lots of software um, and tutorials available on my lab website. But just very briefly, uh, the way VeloViz works is by, um, uh, again, up, uh, uh, obtaining the current and projected future transcriptional states um, from RNA velocity analysis. And then it computes this composite distance between all cell pairs that tries to essentially uh, quantify how similar is, uh, every, uh, is this particular cell to or, or this particular this particular cell's predicted future transcriptional state with all the other observed uh, cells in my population. So, um, so for example, if in this particular case, you know, cell A is um, predicted from RNA velocity analysis to be moving in a direction towards uh, cell B, such that its predicted future transcriptional state is um, pretty similar uh, to cell. Uh, B in the population and likewise is in the same direction. Um, whereas uh, cell A is, um, uh, is uh, uh, predicted to be moving in this direction, which is uh, somewhat close to cell C, uh, but the, the, dir the direction of that uh, movement or uh, the, in higher dimensional transcriptional state is a bit different. Uh, so in this particular case, you know, uh, the composite distance for uh, cell A towards cell B is uh, closer than cell A to cell C. And what this allows us to do is then construct a, a K uh, nearest neighbor graph uh, for the K uh, uh, nearest neighbors in terms of this composite distance. So if K was equal to one, then uh, A is uh, a neighbor with B. And we can then re represent this as a higher dimensional graph where each uh, cell is a node and each edge is, you know, the K, uh, is if they're within the K nearest neighbors of the composite distance. And we can also uh, prune certain edges based on uh, various distance or uh, transcriptional similarity thresholds. But then given this high dimensional graph, we can use um, you know, various uh, force-directed embedding or other graph-based embedding approaches uh, to then visualize this graph in two dimensions or three dimensions if you prefer. So applying this uh, VeloViz to the pancreas, pancreas development, what we find is, uh, as expected, uh, when we have the full data set, 
uh, much like with um, uh, with uh, UMAP and TISNI, we're able to you know, identify the, the progression of the endocrine progenitors into the free endocrine cells and also capture the cyclic ductal cells and also the branching uh, hormone secreting cell types. But perhaps uh, more, uh, more um, interestingly, um, we can show that you know, even when we remove these intermediate uh, cell states, such as the, the preendocrine cells, uh, by taking into consideration the predicted future transcriptional states uh, from the RNA velocity, we can actually um, connect the, endo the endocrine progenitor cells uh, to the uh, hormone secreting cell types and, um, and uh, maintain the, the underlying, whoops, maintain the underlying uh, cellular trajectory. Uh, in contrast with UMAP, which, uh, which created these two distinct uh, subclusters uh, that did not connect the endocrine progenitor cells to the, uh, the hormone secreting cell types. And, uh, and of course, you know, we can um, apply this not only to single cell RNA sequencing data, but also, uh, again, to um, Murfish data via R RNA velocity and C2, where, again, we applied it to the U2OS data and as previously, you know, we, we can see this, this nice cycling uh, trajectory. Um, but even when we remove uh, G2M cells, for example, uh, the cycling trajectory is still maintained in our Velovis embedding. Uh, and, you know, this, the end of the day, you know, this is a high dimensional graph, which can be visualized using other graph, um, you know, graph-based embedding or uh, other uh, visualization approaches. Uh, such as you know, visualizing in three dimensions, or even um, uh, visualizing uh, it uh, this high-dimensional graph in UMAP itself. Uh, so UMAP is still a, a graph-based embedding approach. So rather than um, embedding the graph constructed based on the observed transcriptional state alone, uh, what VeloViz allows us to do is um, integrate the RNA velocity information uh, in creating this graph. And of course, that graph can then still be visualized by UMAP. So uh, as I mentioned again, um, uh, we do have a preprint available and we, uh, Lila and Arpan have developed uh, quite a number of uh, nice tutorials uh, walking you through these different analyses in case you're interested in trying them out. So, so then just to summarize, um, I hope I've been able to show you how uh, single cell and spatially resolved transcriptomics data really demand new computational and statistical tools uh, to try to extract out uh, relevant biological insights. And you know these uh, these these tools um, uh, are needed to ask address questions not only at the the molecular and subcellular level, but then also the cellular and the tissue level. Uh, and uh, one challenge uh, or perhaps limitation with this uh, with single cell and spatially resolved transcriptomic profiling uh, data currently, at least, uh, is that they represent these static snapshots in time. However, um, computational modeling with RNA velocity uh, can be used to predict the future transcriptional state of, uh, of cells and to some extent derive certain elements of dynamic information uh, from these static snapshots. And then finally, taking into consideration these predicted future transcriptional states with VeloViz, uh, we can create a more stable representation of the underlying cellular trajectories, uh, even if uh, intermediate cell states might be missing. And I think looking forward, um, uh, I think it's, it's interesting to think about how uh, transcriptional dynamics inferred from RNA velocity can be potentially just used as a, an additional aspect of cellular heterogeneity. Uh, so there's ongoing work in my lab to uh, try to evaluate um, essentially how, uh, by integrating RNA velocity information, can we more effectively uh, predict uh, protein abundance from RNA? Uh, and you know, generally, you know, we, we measure RNA, but we're really interested in the protein. Um, but currently, uh, it's quite challenging to to predict protein directly from RNA, and the, uh, depending on the system you're looking in. Uh, it might not have a great correlation. So we're wondering if integrating RNA velocity could potentially improve that prediction. Uh, and likewise, um, uh, yeah, some things that we're not really working on, but uh, looking at uh, some of the other works uh, by folks in this department, uh, perhaps you know, allele-specific velocity differences could be of interest. Uh, and likewise, you know, um, uh, uh, interrogating the, the genetic impact or the impact of genetic variants 
on uh, not necessarily the gene expression levels, but the dynamics of the that gene expression. So in terms of RNA velocity, does it impact uh, the, the rate of upregulation and downregulation of different genes, for example? So again, um, there are lots of tutorials available on our website at jeff.works in case you're interested in you know, trying out some of these analyses or reproducing some of the results in our figures or in our papers and so forth. Uh, so you're definitely welcome to you know, check out our lab website. And then with that, um, thank you again for your attention and uh, a shout out to my lab. This is our lab holiday or holiday photo, which was uh, again, of course, virtual this year. Um, but yeah, with that, um, thanks again to, to my lab members, and uh, particularly Lila Ada and Arpan Sahu, whose work was highlighted here, uh, as well as our collaborators, uh, in particular, um, uh, Chenlong Xiao and George Emanuel, who uh, co-led the work in the U2OS cells, and Guiping Wang uh, for her work on the, the Murfish neuron, and of course, uh, Mario Suva and Toshihara on the uh, glioblastoma uh, collaboration. Uh, so with that, um, yeah, definitely happy to take questions and uh, you can always find me on, on uh, via email or uh, or uh, once in a while on Twitter. Awesome, that was a, a fantastic talk. Um, I, have, I have a couple of questions, but uh, I'll, I'll save them for later. Um, so if, if anyone um, has a question for, for Dr. Fan. Hi, this is Adam McLean. Um, I, yeah, that was really, really, um, Great work, very exciting stuff. Um, I was just wondering about kind of the use of RNA velocity um, when you have the spatial transcriptomics such as via Merifish, right? You have this really intriguing e extra component of um, spatial similarity of cells. Like I wonder, so I'm, I'm not sure, maybe you are, but are you using that? Like when you consider um, the like projection of cells onto a, an RNA velocity pot, do you, use a whole sample across the tissue say or would you um like subset that based on like spatial uh distance right because like i say i can't i can't i can't be going very fast to a progenitor if that is spatially distant yeah that's a really interesting idea um currently uh we actually we don't really take into consideration any spatial information uh, i know other labs who are working on you know the pseudo space time uh, analyses uh, try to take into consideration spatial information uh, under the the premise that you know if if cells are um, they look like they're transcriptionally associated but spatially not uh, very far apart then uh, perhaps that's evidence of some type of convergent uh, evolution rather than actual differentiation um, because you know, spatially they're quite far apart um, yeah currently we haven't really uh, taken that uh, much of the spatial uh, or tissue information uh, into consideration, uh, just in part because uh, yeah, we're still kind of trying to figure out how to do our naval velocity in situ with uh, tissues. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's definitely an interesting um, area of uh, potential information integration. And I think you can also think about it the other way around where, uh, you know, given that, you know, these cells are, um, yeah, our, our, you can predict, you know, a, a putative um, future transcriptional state for these cells. Uh, does that indicate any, is that consistent with any, you know, spatial migratory gradients, uh, particularly within the brain? You know, can you predict that, you know, at, at a future time point, you know, you know, this cell is moving towards this transcriptional state, but also the spatial location? Uh, perhaps it's also of interest in cancers where, you know, we have, let's say, you know, angiogenesis or other types of, um, you know, chemokine gradients, things like that. I think, yeah. I think generally it'd be quite exciting to try to integrate spatial information. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we're just one more very briefly, if I may. The, you, cause you have RNA velocity by two completely independent means, whether you're doing sequencing and you're doing unspliced to spliced or you're doing a spatial um, cellular location, cytoplasmic. Like, so have you, can you look at, do you have some data sets where like similar uh, tissues where both have been done? Like, do they give you similar information? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. Um, yeah, that is something we're currently looking into and um, uh, focusing right now on cultured cells, uh, just, you know, on a culture system. Uh, the velocity information that we pre predict from you know, cytoplasmic versus um, nuclear is that the same as spliced versus unspliced. Uh, and 
and, and uh, the, the ultimate goal is to see which, which uh, dynamic model is more predictive of protein. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great question and uh, yeah, definitely something we're working on. Well, thank you. Any other questions? Um, okay, if not, I, I, so I have a couple um, questions, you know, maybe more in the lens of, or through the lens of uh, genetics, but, you know, so I'm, I'm sort of curious about regarding these, the spatial, um, uh, uh, um, the spatial results, right, where you're able to use these, the, not only the type of data you have, but these methods to find enrichment of um, maybe more precise location where genes are expressed like within a cell. Um, and so, you know, is that something that maybe we can then essentially annotate any given gene, right, that we know um, on a more fine grain level, you know, where in the cell we often see it um, and using those annotations go back to something like GWAS, right? And so, you know, like where in the neuron do we see like certain genes expressed more often than not um, and, and overlap that with like GWAS to say like, oh, look, we see an enrichment um, and like, you know, a schizophrenia or like um, uh, uh, some neuropsychiatric disorder for genes like at these particular locations, um, you know, as like, yeah. a, as a way to like take, take these types of data, right? To essentially produce, um, sort of metadata that we would then overlay with like large scale GWAS to understand mechanisms for disease risk. Yeah, um, I think that's a really interesting question. And um, yeah, one thing that my lab is working on is um, essentially you know, finding ways to quantify these different features. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, given the richness of, uh, you know, these data sets, there's just you know, quite a number of different meta, you know, features that we can compute. Um, you know, one thing is, uh, you know, as you mentioned, maybe like the, yeah, let's say the, the, the tendency of genes to be nuclearly um, retained could be one feature. Um, but then if there are other features that are, um, let's say, uh, yeah, I think that there's just quite a number of uh, different features we could compute. Um, some of the features like we're trying to figure out how to compute is uh, actually uh, related to, um, uh, the asymmetry and spatial distribution of genes within cells. You know, if a particular gene is um, always like polarized to one side of the cell, uh, it's going to be, you know, different sides and different cells, but we can see that they're always polarized. Uh, does that have any um, uh, overlap in terms of you know, enrichment of these genes within a GWAS? Uh, I don't know. Uh, and, and, but I think there are just yeah, quite a number of features. You know, we can also look at, you know, let's say genes that are always spatially co-localized with each other, or you know, genes that are you know, enriched in different subcellular structures, um, genes that are you know, more spatially aggregated versus more spatially diffused within the cell. Uh, yeah, I think the yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's a you know a really cool opportunity to get like a much more fine grain. Um, set of annotations for any given gene or groups of genes that, you know, ultimately we can then just take those annotations, whether they're like, you know, binary or, or continuous um, and overlap it like through with some, some, some statistical genetic software like LD score regression or something. Yeah, so like, yeah, I guess. We find this enrichment of signal within these annotations. Yeah, I guess the question I would have for you is, um, do you think it has to be done in a particular cell type uh, that's yeah. relevant to the GWAS? Yeah, absolutely, right? So I, I could see like, you know, again, if we're studying like a neuropsychiatric disorder, right, we would then want to take um, some, some, you know, brain cellular tissue. Um, you know, I'm not sure like which particular brain cells. Um, and, and this is my, maybe my ignorance with, you know, the, the experimental assays on, on what sort of range of cells you can quantify um, through something like Murfish, but, um, uh, you know, as long as it's like a collection within something that I think that would be very useful. And then certainly, you know, maybe as like a baseline, take some other like non-relevant tissue to see that, that there's an enrichment overall. And then like similarly, I, I do wonder is if there's a way to go back from the velocity data, right? So if you have these trajectories along these cell states, you know, is a, a way to take that as like one, either a way to map those back to some, um, you know, like what, what constituent genes are driving those trajectories for any given cell state to take those as like some quantitative annotation 
um, to overlay with GWAS. And I guess like- um, mm, Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, if right, there's a particular like, yeah, a set of genes that are um, associated with uh, differentiation or progression uh, that are driving out uh, the dynamics of this cellular trajectory and, uh, and use that rather than, you know, differential expression. Uh, yeah, so right, because maybe, maybe it's like, at, you know, at a certain time, like the context is, is um, some like developmental context is important, again, for like maybe some neuropsychiatric disorder, like maybe it's when, um, you know, like some, some, some dendrites are forming earlier on um, and like that gets disrupted somehow. And so genes that are enriched at that time point through this trajectory um, might, might provide some information. Um, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. I think it's like a really exciting opportunity to 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 like leverage these tools that quantify this stuff um, uh, and think about how we can integrate that with Geos in some way. Yeah, it kind of just it, it just completely boggles my mind. Like the kind of like theoretical possibilities, right? Just even of merfish alone, like how much we're just so barely scratching the surface. I mean, you're talking about like the all that's possible just within a cell on like spatial statistics of gene expression, but you have thousands of cells live in, I mean, sit fixed in a tissue in theory, right? So then you have a great wealth of statistics on gene expression per single cell, and you have thousands of cells with a spatial resolution across cells. So kind of just like, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The actually, amount left want... to be done, it just, it kind of makes me a bit dizzy, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, actually one fun story um, from the neuron analysis. Um, you know, one thing we were really interested in was actually uh, dendritic heterogeneity within the cell. So are certain dendrites within the same neuron, you know, transcriptionally distinct from each other because they have to, you know, respond to local environment, environmental cues. Um, so, yeah, so I was doing this analysis where, you yeah, know, you look for, you know, differentially expressed genes between, you know, dendrites and, you know, are they enriched in certain, um, yeah, certain processes. And I felt like I was finding, uh, you know, these really interesting signals, uh, but then, you know, I had to think about how, you know, I, I was looking at, you know, thousands of genes and hundreds of thousands of cells. So then, you know, with multiple testing correction, you know, it was, it was almost like bound to find some interesting signal that, you know, I guess when you put your biologist hat on, you're, you're led to believe it must be so interesting, but then when you put the you know, statistics hat on, it's like, oh, this is actually fully expected within the realm of this random noise. And yeah, that is just, I think, still boggles my mind. <laughs> super, super cool. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Well, if not, let's um, thank Dr. Fan once again. That, you know, was a fantastic talk. I think it was just 